On this week's What the Ship, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has issued their annual Review of Maritime Transport 2023. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So this week, we're looking at the Review of Maritime Transport 2023. It was just World Maritime Day. I can't think of any way better to celebrate World Maritime Day than to look at this annual publication that comes out from Jan Huffman and the crew at UNCTAD. I've got my copy here. I had to print it off, so uh, I haven't gotten my, my, my actual copy yet, but I'm hoping that UNCTAD is sending me one. They sent me one last year, so hoping to build my library here of the Review of Maritime Transport. This is a Bible for many people in the shipping industry because it gives it gives you a great snapshot of what's happening, not just in the industry, but what has been happening in the past. They've got this organized in five chapters. We do five stories here on What the Ship, so I could not think of anything better to do this week than to do a review of the review of Maritime Transport. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's dive into this. All right, I do look forward to this every year, so I'm kind of excited to do the review and kind of go through it. So we'll break it up into our five stories by chapters, which is exactly what they do. The first chapter in the review deals with international maritime trade. So this really looks at what's being moved on the world's oceans, and they do a great job of that. So one of the big things here has to deal with the fact that maritime trade is contracting in 2022. We're seeing a decrease in the amount of goods being shipped around the world. Matter of fact, we saw a drop from 2022, from, from 2021 to 2022. All right, my criticism right off the bat, and it's like the only criticism I have of the review of maritime transport, is in the past, they've had a yearly chart in here that shows how much goods is moved around the planet. I love that chart because it just shows you the growth of global trade. They don't have it in this one. I kind of think it's missing. I think you need to put it back in. That's going to be my only criticism, but I, I love this review anyway. But in the text, they talk about this. So in 2021, the amount of goods moved around the world was 12 billion, 72 million tons of cargo. And then there's a slight drop. It goes down to 12 billion, 27 million tons of cargo. To put that into historical perspective, right around 1950, about half a billion tons of cargo moving around. We're over 12 billion today. But the key thing here in the chart is that they're talking about a growth of right around about 2%, 2.1, 2.2% over the next five years. That's what the way we expect to see trade increase here. And again, we're coming off the backside of COVID. That's one of the reasons why you're seeing a bit of a drop. In terms of above average growth in energy trade carried in tankers and moderate growth for dry bulk trade projected for 2023. So one of the things that chart does would take that 12 billion tons and break it up into its individual components here, which is what you see. Dry bulk is the most common good shipped in terms of tonnage on the world's oceans. Whether it's grain or ore, that's what we're moving around. And you can see how it kind of peaked up a little in 2021, came down in 2022, but projected to grow into 2023 and 2024. Oil had that big drop. Why? Because nobody was moving for a while there because of COVID. And now all of a sudden we see oil on the rise again. Containers had the peak because of everybody ordering everything, then dipped and now with an expected grow. And then the other areas are other dry gas with an increase in chemicals, basically with a very slight increase. But they represent a very small percentage of the total cargo being moved. But that gas is key, especially with liquefied natural gas replacing natural gas coming out of Russia after the, the boycotts. The other element here is the distance traveled by sea of refined oil products, crude oil, and grain has increased. In other words, we're shipping goods, a ton of goods, over a longer distance. This is a, a measurement known as ton miles. And you'll see grain is the one that has probably had the biggest increase. Now, this has been going on since the early 2000s. We've seen this increase with the amount of grain moving on. And a lot of that has to do with more grain coming out of other regions, Australia, Brazil, South America, Canada, the United States. We are moving grain over much longer distances and bulk carriers are getting bigger and bigger actually. So this is one of the reasons why we see grain taking such a big leap here. Other, other bulk here, you see this is largely ore and coal moving through here. They are also seeing that increase. Where you're seeing a decrease is in containers. And I would argue a lot of that has to do with feeder vessels, small container ships working coastwise and international between 
Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia. A lot of goods are moved that way because of the poor road and rail networks. So we're seeing coastal shipping being used a lot more in those areas. And oil taking a huge uptick. This has a lot to do with Russia, Ukraine and what OPEC has been doing. We're seeing a modest recovery in the containerized trade area. Uh, we saw a little bit of a dip here in terms of containerized trade. So when you look at the totals here in terms of containerized trade, in 2021, 164 million TEUs. A TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. Most of the containers you see on ships are 40-foot units, twice the size of a TEU, an FEU. But 164 million TEUs in 2021, a slight drop going into 2022, 163 million TEU. But again, we can expect to see a little bit of an increase coming out of 2023. This has been basically stabilized here over the last three years, largely because we had a peak with COVID, had the drop. You see that slight drop in 2022? That was mainly in the second half of 2022. And then we see it kind of resume back in 2023. But the percentages are showing that it's slowing down quite a bit. We don't see that huge, massive growth that we did early in the 2000s and then immediately after the global recession. Next, we're looking at where that trade is going. Where's that container flow going? Where are those 163 million containers going? And the largest group of those are on the Trans-Pacific, about 28.2 million on the Trans-Pacific, 24.2 million on Asia to Europe, and then another 8.5 million on the transatlantic. The remaining of that uh, 163 million are scattered in north to north, south to south, uh, north south routes, and feeder services in and around areas. Next, we look at energy security needs intersect with global, global environmental sustainability goals. So this is looking at gas seaborne trade grow, uh, growth, tons and ton miles. Again, ton miles is how far you have to move a ton. And largely, these are pretty much in sync most of the time. Uh, you may see a little bit of growth here and there where you really see it happen is in 2020, where all of a sudden you saw a big growth all of a sudden take place in where we're moving energy. Uh, when we start talking about gas, we're talking about LNG and LPG. And in particularly since 2016, we've seen uh, the, the amount of gas being moved increase dramatically. And again, this is in percentage change. This is in the percentage change, not in the total change. And so you're definitely seeing this reflected in the uh, movement of LNG and LPG across. We're seeing it moved a greater distances that flipped in 2022, but now it's back on the rise again. This chart is a really interesting one. It looks at exporters and importers of oil, oil products, coal, and liquefied natural gas. Basically, it looks at top importers and top exporters for 2022. So if you look at crude oil, for example, 58% of the world's crude oil is going into, into Asia. 25.9% is going into Europe. But of that 58.1% going into Asia, two U Asian countries are dominating that. That is China with 22.8% and India with 11.7%. Where's the bulk of the oil coming out of? Middle East and, and uh, uh, Persian Gulf, almost 47.4% coming out. When you look at oil products, where are oil products going? Who's importing them? Well, Asia's importing 31.4%. The Americas, 20.1%. Southeast Asia, 16.9%. Who's the biggest exporters? Ironically, Europe, a huge exporter of oil products. This is refineries. This is where oil goes to get refined and then shipped out. 34.1%, 18.4% out of the Middle East and Gulf. Coal, where does coal go? Holy cow, 82.2% of coal goes into Asia. And who's the big consumers? India and China at over 19% apiece. Where's that coal coming from? Indonesia, Indonesia at 38.2%. Think about how important that is. Indonesia, which is right there, right between India and China, in a commanding position to be a coal exporter 
energy provider to those two countries. And then right behind it is Australia. If you want to get coal from Australia to China, got to go through Indonesian waters. If you want to go to India, you got to go past Indonesia. And there you see Australia at 27.6%, then Russia, 12.9%. And then finally, LNG. Who's consuming liquefied natural gas? It is your, excuse me, Asia at 64.1%. And if you look down there at three, four, and five, the three big consumers, Japan, China, Korea. And then Europe at 31%. And where's this LNG coming from? It's coming from the Atlantic Basin, 39.2%. It's coming from Asia Pacific, 36.9%. It's coming from the Middle East, 24 And those are the US, Australia, and Qatar. That's where we see that coming from. And then finally in this section, changing grain trade patterns and the implications for food security. Who are the top importers in 2022? Who are the top importers in the first half of 2023 versus top exporters? We'll look at top importers for 2022. Obviously, Asia is the big importer, 48.4%, with China taking 26.5% of that. China is a consumer of resources, oil, coal, and grain. Where's that grain coming from? Well, if you look at top exporters, it's South America, 38.4%. Remember what I said about South America, the river plot region, Brazil, Argentina, all along that region, big, huge, massive grain carriers coming out of the plot and heading south of Africa. These are the big Cape ships, they're called, because they go around the Cape of Good Hope. These are massive ore carriers coming out of there. Then you have North America at 28.1%. And if you look at those total South America, total North America, they're dominated by Brazil in the South, the U.S. in the North. So that's our look at Chapter 1 here of the Review of Maritime Transport. Chapter 2 takes a look at the world shipping fleet, their services and freight rates. So this is a kind of delving in to the ships here with a little bit more data on what exactly the fleets look like. So looking at the fleets here, one of the things we've seen consistently over the past decades is the growth of the world's fleet. Go back to the 1980s and even up into the 2000s, and the world fleet had basically stabilized at about 500 million uh, uh, deadweight tons. This chart here, the left side there, is in thousands of deadweight tons. So you're looking at about 500 million deadweight tons. And then all of a sudden, in the mid-2000s, we saw the growth of vessels. I mean, the growth of ships on steroids. Uh, Cape vessels, tankers, container ships, you name it. We saw all of a sudden the, 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 the absolute growth of vessels and the growth of the number of vessels. So that now we're sitting at over, over 2 billion deadweight tons of ships out there. Now the growth has slowed down. We're down to 3.2%. And that slow, that slow growth means that ships are around for a little bit longer. We're not replacing them as fast as we used to, which means the fleet is getting older. And an older fleet does raise concerns out there about the operations of the vessels. Uh, we're looking at over 19 years of age for ships on average at this point. When we look at deliveries of new built ships, where are new ships coming from? Well, the top three remain the top three, with China, Japan, and Korea at the top three. They represent 93% of the world shipping, 46.6% for China, 17.2% for Japan, and 29.2% for Korea. And then you see a change here. Philippines had been holding at about 1%. Well, they have dropped, and on the rise is Vietnam. I think Vietnam is a country we need to be watching in terms of shipbuilding. They are definitely going to be a challenger out there in the Far East. Add to it Europe at about 4.4%, and then the entire rest of the world at 1%, including a fraction of a percent for the United States. If you look at where ships are, the type of ships that are being built, well, if you're a bulk carrier, you're being built largely in China, maybe in Japan. If you're an oil tanker, Korea, and then China. If you're a container ship, you're being built in China and then Korea. If you're a gas carrier, it's Korea, but China is on the rise on this. They are building a lot more LNG carriers right now. If you're a ferry or a passenger ship, you're in Europe. This is, the, this is where Europe has their one little area in the building of ferries and extremely large ocean-going uh, passenger liners. However, a recent deal between Fincantieri, the Italian shipping line, and China to start building passenger liners in China may see that number begin to decline quickly. 
Uh, in terms of general cargo vessels, uh, China is dominating that. On the offshore side, China is dominating that. And then again, this is the move we're seeing take place here. China is definitely on the growth at nearly 50% of the world ships. One out of two ships are being built largely in China. Japan is on the decline. Korea is struggling to maintain that second place position. This is really a three-way race right now going on for shipbuilding. And it's cutthroat between these three countries. China is trying to run Japan out of business. Korea feel, feels the same exact way. And then we'll wind up with a duopoly between China and Korea in terms of shipbuilding. It's one of the reasons why we see a lot of effort right now about re-kicking in and restarting national shipbuilding programs for the fear that China will be the dominant force. This looks at the leading flags of registry and ownership. So we get this list of the top 35 all the time. When we look in terms of registration, Liberia has once again jumped to the first place. They recently eclipsed Panama. And now Liberia with 16.6% .6 of the world's fleet by deadweight tonnage is the largest registry in the world. Again, it's not Liberia. You don't have to go to Monrovia to register your ship. You just have to take an exit outside of Dulles Airport because the Liberian registry is is right there. Then you have Panama at 16.1%, Marshall Islands, don't worry, you don't have to get on a plane to the Marshall Islands either, you just have to get off at a different exit after you leave Dulles Airport in the United States. And then Hong Kong in fourth, Singapore, China, Malta, Bahamas, Greece, and Japan, the top 10. Notice if you bring Hong Kong and China together for a long time, they were number two. Now they're at number three. They've been eclipsed by Liberia and Panama. At 21st place is the United States. And if you look at some countries in there, you'll see the international registries of Madeira for Portugal, of uh, uh, Dan Denmark, of Norway in there, Iran sitting there at 16th place. Uh, the United Kingdom has fallen down the 24th place, Russia at 23rd. So again, nations are, are all up and down that, that, that spectrum there. In terms of ownerships, it's the Greeks. It's always going to be the Greeks. It has always been the Greeks. Greeks have a very commanding lead, 17.4% of the world's fleet, followed by China, Japan, Singapore, and then Hong Kong. If you look at what China and Hong Kong have, China has 13.4%. Hong Kong, 5.2%. That makes China actually the largest owner of ships in the world. So the Greeks may not be the number one for very long. Uh, and then you go down that list there, Germany 7, Taiwan, United Kingdom, Norway, the United States number 11 and falling on that list. Uh, definitely see the United States with less ownership of ships year by year happening here. And the growth is definitely in Asia with China, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, definitely seeing the uh, Asian influence here when it comes to ownership. Global fleet renewal and capacity growth faces, uh, faces uncertainty. We are not building as many ships. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's happening around the world is consolidation of shipyards. We've lost 40% of the world's shipyards since 2009. Shipyards are consolidating capacity numbers. We're building less ships and fewer of them. Uh, we've seen that happening since the late 2000s where the total number of ships being built are decreasing. Got a little bit of an uptick in 2022 because the container liners are flush with cash, so they're building new container ships. But if you look at percentage-wise, it has not been great for the growth and development of new ships. The container shipping is adjusting to a new normalized market condition. This shows you the big shipping firms, kind of the 10 big shipping firms right there. The blue line shows you the percentage of total fleet capacity they had in 2006, and now the capacity they have in 2023. So Mediterranean Shipping Company, which had been really the, uh, is now the biggest Maersk that had been the dominant one falls to second place, about to fall to third place as CMA CGM eclipses them. Costco, the Chinese overseas shipping company, in a good fourth place position. Hapag Lloyd of Germany, Evergreen of Taiwan, ONE of Japan, HMM of Korea, Yang Min of uh, Taiwan, and then Zim. Zim was the newest player on the, on, the, on the stage in many ways, had a very big IPO opening during the supply chain. Uh, they're sitting there, Israeli-based firm. 
And then we look at container freight rates shifting tides in 2022 and stabilization in 2023. So, I, I mean, obviously, if you follow this channel, we've talked about freight rates and the craziness that has been freight rates in terms of demand and supply chain. And what you see here is when the demand goes up, the rates go up. And we saw that post-2008 when all of a sudden there was a big demand went up. And then we saw the same thing in 2020 when demand went through the roof and freight rates kind of followed suit. We definitely see that. And if you look at this chart, which actually tracks the freight rates, you can see that huge, massive bulge in there based on the Shanghai Containerized Freight uh, Index. You get a good kind of feel here for how those freight rates play out there. I mean, you can see where COVID kind of hit in here. And then all of a sudden we see those freight rates bottoming out and now kind of plateauing out. And the big issue, of we, as we've been talking about consistently here on the channel, is where do they wind up? Then we see the dry bulk market uh, marked by volatility in 2022 and a downturn in the second half. Uh, everybody was thinking that dry bulk would have seen an increase, but we don't. Uh, lots of times when you see dry bulk fall down, that's a good le leading indicator of what's going to happen in the container market because if you need less energy less raw materials you're going to get less finished product so a lot of people watch the bulk market to see what the economy is going to do and where uh, the container sector is going and what we saw is in the latter half of 2022 man the bulk market just all of a sudden dropped but you also got to be careful of where you're looking at uh, cape size vessels, which are the large, uh, uh, large massive vessels that go that long distance. Uh, again, a lot of people are shifting where they're getting their goods from. And that's another element we have here. And then finally, this strong re revival of the tanker market in 2022 and into 2023. Tanker market suffered tremendously during the beginning of COVID because there was a, a decrease in gas consumption, diesel consumption. Uh, we, were, we were not driving as much. We weren't going on vacation. And so you saw that. You saw that kind of all of a sudden fall and, and you saw freight rates for tankers begin to drop. And matter of fact, you had a period here where you had some negative freight rates going in for VLCCs, where the ships were doing nothing and they would pay you for, for services. Uh, it has gone back up again. And the question is, where does that go in the future? All right, that was chapter two of that, of, of the review of maritime transport. Uh, we're going to take a look at chapters three, four, and five. Not as big, but again, they cover some key topics. So one of the big topics that uh, UNCTAD has been following consistently is the issue of decarbonizing shipping. Big push by the International Maritime Organization to get global shipping to decrease its carbon footprint by 50% by 2050. Uh, and so you see that effort being done here. And so this chart takes a look at the emissions vary by engine and ship type, age and service. So right here, you're seeing the total carbon dioxide emissions by vessels types and the tons uh, from January of 2012 up to March of 2023. And you can see the groups that have the leading uh, indicators, tankers, dry bulk and general cargo, containers, vehicle and row, 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 passengers, which is disproportionate to their numbers, by the way, passengers, and then the offshore and services. And what you see here and what this chart really should indicate to you is that we're actually increasing our output of carbon dioxide over the years, even though we're doing a lot to reduce emissions because of the growth of the size of the fleet and where that fleet is traveling, we're seeing a big increase right now. In terms of who's doing it, if you look on the left there by flag of registration or on the right by ownership, who's doing it in 2022? Well, in terms of registry in 2022, it's Liberia, it's Panama, it's the Marshall Islands, it's Hong Kong, it's Singapore, Malta. It follows pretty much in sync with whoever has the most ships in their registry. Same thing with ownership, except ownership is a little bit different in that China is not the leading ownership, but yet their ships are the ones that are causing the most pollution. You see that there with China, with Japan, Greece, and then the United States of America, which is at fourth place. And again, this has a lot to do with coastal shipping and what's being done, ships on the Great Lakes, ships that have not been modernized and updated enough. And so I think this is a really interesting uh, uh, chart here for measuring how everything is happening. And then uh, next chart here, we're going to look at 
is how uh, shipping is still really in its infancy in this transition of fuels. So this chart looks at alternate fuel uptake of the world fleet in terms of uh, the order book. Uh, so you got the active fleet, and then you have the order book. This is in gross tons, not number of vessels. So if you look at the fleet that's out there right now, 94.5% of the ocean-going fleet out there is using conventional fuels, largely diesel fuel. That's what the main propulsion is. When you look at alternatives, it's 5.5%, largely LNG, with some other ones in there, LPG, uh, battery hybrid, and methanol. But the order book is much different. Two-thirds of the order book is for conventional fuels. A third is for entirely different alternative fuels, with most of, most of it being liquefied natural gas. That seems to be where we're having that. And then when we look here, the trends in alternative fuel-capable and energy-saving technology fitted fleet what the percentages is. We're looking at eco electronic engines. This is battery. This is all those methods we're using to capture power. Uh, you're looking at alternative fuels. That seems to be the trend that's on the rise here tremendously. And then emission saving technology. This is largely scrubbers. This is what you're using to, if you're burning the high sulfur fuel, you can't get your hands on low sulfur fuel or you want to burn high sulfur fuel because it's much cheaper, then you're using scrubber technology and that's the technology used. Uh, chapter four looks at port performance and maritime trade and transport facilitation. Again, one of the things that a review of maritime transport loves to do is take a look at what's going on in ports around the world, particularly developing ports and what is happening. So port calls and traffic recovery from the pandemic crisis. So this looks at port calls per half year world total. And the biggest type of vessels making port calls are liquid bulk carriers. Those are the ones we see, those are tankers. Those are what we would refer to as tankers, then container ships, and then dry bulkers down there at the bottom. Uh, and when you see low numbers here, again, this is the number of, 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 of days of port calls, and you have to also measure it. But again, dry bulks are the ships carrying the most tonnage out there. Uh, and then you can see where they're getting that. Passenger ships, just proportionally much higher. That's an entirely different scale they're using there. And passenger ships had that huge dip in 2020 because, again, nobody was sailing on them. But now they're once again making these big port calls. That's why there's a big push in the passenger sector to really fix their emissions because they spend a lot of times in port and they tend to be in heavily residential areas where the ships come in and they're emitting a lot of exhaust. There's a big push to get better emissions on cruise ships out there. The liner, shipper, uh, liner shipping con connectivity back to a growth trend. So this is a great measurement. This really measures how the world is connected together via containers. And what you see here is a, a, a scale that is used. Uh, it's a measurement device. And Asia is growing. That's a big thing. North America is growing. Europe is growing. The world is growing. And, and more importantly, lesser uh, developed uh, economies uh, in Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Oceania are seeing a bit of a growth. Not as much, but over time, we're definitely seeing. Again, this is a, growth, a chart from 2006 to the modern day. And we're seeing that growth nowhere near as much as Asia, North America, and Europe. But we're starting to see that trend that containerization is doing a great job of flattening out the world in terms of economy and ability to get goods and resources. This chart here, Asian countries continue to lead in cargo handling performance. Wow. If you look at this chart, they look at the top 25 countries in this chart, which countries have the top 25 ports under the container port performance index? Uh, it clearly, clearly, clearly shows you that Asia is that dominant country when it comes to this. Uh, they are on the mark. And where the U.S. suffers is in its ability to cycle containers in the port. I looked at some of the metrics and measurements in this. And the U.S. is an aberration. One of the big problems we have is that we can move containers on and off the ship as fast as everybody else. We have the same technology, same cranes. The problem is getting them off the ship onto handlers and out into the yards. There's a lot, I mean a massive lag time in the transition of containers from the next container to the next container. And a lot of what's being done in a lot of ports is these automated kind of bomb carts. These are the ones that move the containers. We do it by human. 
You can still be as fast with it. We just have to improve the technology here. And that doesn't mean we have to replace human beings in driving the carts. We just need to make a smoother flow of containers off and on the vessels to get her up. This is why you see this chart and you look at where the top container ports are. It's China, Oman, the UAE, Colombia, Morocco, Malaysia, China, Qatar, China, Hong Kong, Egypt, Japan, Vietnam, China, China, Saudi Arabia, Ecuador, Spain, Singapore, Colombia, Korea, Korea, China, Djibouti, and China. No reason the U.S. cannot be breaking into this area. Yet we kind of miss this. And if you look at this, this is the minutes per container move, what I was talking about before. Look at this chart. Look at China and the minutes per between container move. It, it, they do it in terms of ships and, and the size of ships. And so if you look at ships that are, you know, fairly small size, uh, uh range they're moving it's taking anywhere from 3.7 to a half a minute to move a container whereas in the united states you can see that the united states is almost consistently uh leading here at the top not in this case but 2.6 2.4 2 2 2 2 1.9 1.2 that's the area where the united states is having its big problem and this is where we should be spending our money on port development and really making our ports more efficient. Again, your ability to move containers through a port, to transition them out of the port. This is one of the issues we had in the supply chain crisis back in the early 2020s. Uh, we did not have a lack of ships. There were plenty of ships off of LA and Long Beach. The problem became is we over congested the port and the throughput issue became the major concern we have. And we really need to be addressing that. All right, last section. And I'm just going to really summarize what they put in this last section, because I think this last section uh, covers a kind of vital area, and that is legal issues and regulatory developments. So three main points I want to pull from the report. Regulatory developments may facilitate the future use of electronic bills of lading. We are still, in some cases, using paper and fax machines. This, this has got to change in the shipping industry. It has to. We have got to get better. The problem is a lot of shipping companies and uh, transporters want to use their own proprietary systems, and so the systems don't communicate well with each other. Second, a growing importance of regulatory measures under the auspices of International Maritime Organization to combat pollution from ships in the context of the 2030 agenda. We're going to see an acceleration of decarbonization. There's no doubt about that. The question is, can the shipping firms, the shipping industry keep up with what is going to be required? And that's a big question. And most importantly, it's going to transfer cost toward shipping because as these new technologies come out, it's going to be more expensive. And then finally, other legal and regulatory developments affecting transportation in 2023 and beyond. There are so many issues that are looming on the horizon here that it's almost, it's bewildering at times. There, there's a lot coming down the road here for ocean shipping. And one of the things I love about UNCTAD is you can follow them all year long. They're doing reports. They're doing uh, in-depth studies. They will take this report and then do more focused studies on different areas. You should really follow them. I think they're a great follow. They do a lot of work. I know a lot of people have issues with the United Nations. I understand that. But this is an institution and an organization, UNCTAD, that is really trying to measure data. And if you look at where they get their data from, they get it from a lot of commercial sources out there that if you had to pay for it, by the way, would cost you a fortune. The fact that they're paying for that and getting it and then putting it together in a great handy booklet, 150 something pages, is a tremendous resource. Every year when I teach my maritime industry policy class, I have my students look at this report and we talk about what are the big issues looming in terms of ocean shipping going forward. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. It was a little long. I apologize, but I wanted to cover all five areas. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. So be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thing, thumbs up. And if you can support the page, how do you do that? Hit the super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page, or you can head on over to Patreon and become a monthly yearly subscriber of the channel. For everybody here at What's Going On With Shipping, and by everybody, I mean me, thanks for watching.